Yep, thank you. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. I came here first in 2015, and ever since then I just kind of fell in love with this place because uh, especially nowadays when you go to Bitcoin and blockchain conferences, they've kind of taken a turn. Uh, the more mainstream something seems to become, the more tainted it becomes, it seems. Um, so I really love that this organization has always held the true values of cryptocurrency and what it represents, um, and the open source space, as well as uh, what all of this really means. I mean, uh, for myself, just to give you a background, I've been involved uh, in the crypto sphere since 2013. And, you know, I had a full functioning uh, design business in Australia and as soon as I learned what this technology really means, I kind of dropped everything and gave everything I had to this field. And since then I worked as a journalist, I worked with various projects such as Storage, BitNation and a few other uh, organizations throughout the way. I learned a lot, I met a lot of people. And fundamentally, no matter what your background is and what your interest is, and this is something which I will go over, um, there's something that draws us all here. I mean, we're not all from the same uh, skill set or from the same background or same nationality or whatever it is, but we have a common theme here that has brought us all here. We're hoping to find something that's better than the existing uh, structures that are in our environment. So yeah, my name is Amin Rafi. Welcome to my talk. I hope to inspire you through some of the lessons I've learned along the way, some of the projects I've worked with along the way, as well as some of the common themes that I see among all the people who are interested in this space. Um, so to just start off with, maybe I put it in my pocket, I did. Um, so to start off with, I guess a common theme between all of these segments that we're trying to cover is corruption. And whether it's through government, education, science, uh, place of work, hierarchy at work, and any other centralized models, we can see a high level of corruption. And this is usually linked to the need to have control over circumstances. And where does it come from? So this is a great quote, which I'm sure a lot of you are uh, familiar with. But it seems when you place someone in a position to have power, um, over time moral values decay, uh, the more power this individual is given. And this is very important when we look at whether it's a role in the government, a role as in a, you know, a leader in a group or whatever it may be. We elect as presidential selection or prime ministers or people of power these individuals and we believe that this one individual can change the scene for an entire country filled with millions of people. And for me this is kind of unnatural to think that way, but yet we have grown to believe that this is it, that this person may be after hundreds of years that yet finally this model is going to come into place and work finally. And this is not true. Um, we have a lot of issues in our current society. Whether it's government, education, science, medicine, our diet, all of these have been tainted by centralized powers to send a message that aligns with profit and with having control, monopolizing the market in those certain industries. And here lies the issue of uh, modern society because to overrun or overcome these boundaries, limitations, we really need a different approach. Um, so what have we seen? What samples can we take from these sort of uh, industries? So one of them, for example, is the ongoing uh, issue in Venezuela. And this happened in Zimbabwe as well. And I think it's quite interesting when you model these uh, issues in countries such as Venezuela and Zimbabwe. Some may look at them and say, well, they can finally catch up to our society. They're going through something. But for me, I like to look at it differently. I like to think that they live in the future because they have already come to see that you can't trust the government with your money. They have come to see how quickly, if things turn, that money will be taken from you and will become worth, uh, worthless. We, on the other hand, in more depicted as modern societies, tend to think or at least live in an illusion where we believe everything will work out. I mean, 2008 really showed how powerless we are. And even the government 
didn't have the power to stand against the banking institutions and let the whole thing crumble. And money from individuals, from citizens, was taken to bail out these giants in our society. So that's just one sample. Um, this is a quick video. I think it's very interesting. Um, it was from Netherlands. Okay. Yeah, please do. And I think it, oh no. <laughs> I think because I'm outside of Netherlands, it doesn't. If you see what the YouTube link, you will go there. Sorry, no, no, it's because the, how old does it come? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Um, we can move on. It was an interesting video. Um, it's called How the Brain of a Banker Works, or something along those lines. And the person that is part of the video is an anthropologist. So he was advising uh, people in the minister on how to overcome situations like 2008. And a great example he gave was, if you want to send people to Mars, for example, and start a colony, bankers would be the best people to send because they are the blueprint of just thinking for themselves. Um, and it would be the best thing to do if you're sending them to Mars. But unfortunately in our world, in our system, such a thing does not help every, the collective. And this comes from a centralized model because when individuals are placed there and they're given responsibility to look after the welfare of all the people within that country, it's very hard to think outside yourself and maybe a few around you. Um, if you're not dealing with these people, if you're not interacting with these individuals, it's almost uh, impossible to do that. So, story time. Um, I was giving a presentation in Utrecht, the city in the Netherlands, and after I spoke about what decentralization is, what blockchains can do, what it allows, uh, you know, forms of opting into your information being shared in some instances. In other instances, this is not the case. Um, a banker came up to me and he said, I have a huge problem with your entire talk because what you're saying is we pretty much lose all the metadata and all the information that we currently use to give people loans or uh, find out when they need to be kind of buying a house and this kind of information to sell them a mortgage or other forms of loans. And he goes, with your system, we won't be able to do this. Um, he was very sad about it, um, not realizing that that's the whole point, that, you know, these sort of uh, thoughts need to go. And again, the person was reflecting onto themselves, going, well, poor old me, I won't be able to do anything. Um, you know, in my opinion, he could perhaps get a job that's actually valuable um, and contribute something useful to society. But what made it even more scarier, he said currently up to three years in advance, we can determine what a person's behavior is going to be better than even they know. We know when, um, if they're going to buy a house before they even think about it. Um, just based on the purchase habits, based on the amount of loans they have, whether it's a student loan or other sort of uh, metadata collected from daily purchases or bigger than that. And I found this quite alarming because we don't know this. Um, this is information that we freely give out to these kind of institutions. And it would be nice if we were at least rewarded for it or, you know, uh, we were just at least told about it. But we're not told about it. This information is freely, uh, we give it freely to the organizations and they make a lot of money selling it to third parties. And again, here lies another issue of centralization, that they are acting on our behalf and taking this information. And perhaps a lot of aspects of our reality is manipulated due to them having access to this information. Um, so in the case of Venezuela and in the case of uh, Zimbabwe, we can see hyperinflation. Um, this, this is what happens when you don't have control uh, over the amount of currency that's in circulation. And centralization in a lot of cases leads to a greater form of centralization. And the same perhaps is true for decentralization. So perhaps now that we have opened the doors for new possibilities that are decentralized, it will greatly speed up the process and we'll have more and more advances towards decentralization. And we can already see forms of that, whether you know it's Uber or Airbnb, which are the, the, the first steps to decentralization, but yet still they are controlled by a central entity. Um, and from there we can progress to a more open and more advanced form of it. 
And again, if you look at Catalonia, there's another example of this. Um, there exists a culture of people um, who address themselves with a different category to all of Spain. They wanted to fight for their freedom. They wanted to have independence. Due to the centralized authorities, it caused a lot of violence and uprising within the country. Uh, people were attacked or abused or whatever else that took place. For me, this doesn't make any sense because you have a group of people who have decided for themselves that they want to do things differently. They want to live in accordance to their own principles or their own culture. And they are being held back by a centralized authority. So these are some examples of how centralization causes issues. Other things for me are, for example, the Bitcoin debit cards. These were a fantastic way, for example, for refugees to gain access to financial aid or systems because unless an estate within Europe recognizes you, you can't go and open up a bank account. So Bitcoin debit cards was a great way for individuals to get access to money through whether it was donations or through family or friends converting cash overseas and sending it to them. It was a really fantastic way. And the limit at that time was, I think, 1,000 euros. So the European Union thought this was a bad idea. And they decided to reduce it to 250 euros. And they also made it so a lot of debit card providers could not provide this card for anyone outside of Europe. And this went under the title of uh, anti-terrorism policies. And for me, again, it's, it's quite puzzling because if someone really wanted to, they could go work a cash job. I mean, a thousand euros isn't that much. You would have to work perhaps two weeks to get that cash. How much are you limiting acts of violence by reducing the card's limit from 1,000 euros to 250? And at the same time, how many people have you affected that could have benefited from that larger limit in order to protect the nation from your version of terrorism? And I decided to look into this. So for my own personal research, I was really, really concerned and also interested to know what is the actual difference between the number of risks within our society. So whether it's from terrorism, from diet, from other issues within our societies, this, this became quite, a, quite an interesting topic for me. So I looked into it, and you can see the numbers there. And some may argue that perhaps some of the things that relate to these deaths are due to personal choice. So at least the person had the choice to do it. But addiction is not a personal choice, um, quite the contrary. Uh, if you don't know that you're doing something habitually or it's been programmed into you due to movies, environment, um, society, or addiction as a biological issue, um, these are outside of your control. They are no different to outside influences, whether it's terrorism or addiction or dietary or other things. So I was quite alarmed, so I wanted to look into it further. Um, and I came, and th this is the point where things got really confusing for me, because we have so much focus around the topic of anti-terrorism these days. And I'm not saying that that's not worthy of our time. I would never say such a thing. Though it would be nice if the same amount of focus was given to other issues in our environment. And the only thing I can kind of pin it on is again centralization because when you have centralization the information is kind of trickled down through selective or exclusive sources. Now if we had true openness of information and availability to uh, statistics that was depicted in an unbiased manner, we would approach issues in our societies in a more holistic way rather than one that covers certain aspects that uh, may benefit a point of view or legislation or policies and leave others that perhaps increases profits and uh, other things for organizations that are part of the society. So that's from a completely different perspective. So now bringing it back to the technological zone, Equifax, I'm sure a lot of you are aware, recently was hacked. And this is not obviously the first time this has happened. Uh, the IRS in the US was hacked. I think 70 or so million records, uh, personal records was released. And this was 143 million. And 
you know, with a country of 350 million as the population, this is quite alarming. I mean, even 1 million or even 10,000 would be alarming, let alone 143 million records. And this, again, doesn't really help the notion of centralization because, you know, constantly we see warfare against decentralization and these open uh, communities in the news, but at the same time, these things are happening, so they're not really helping their own cause. And to give you more information on this, uh, I was invited to take part in a sort of private discussion in Switzerland with professionals and, uh, you know, experts of such fields. And for me, it was really amusing, you know, I had professors from uh, universities, software engineers with PhDs, and the general topic was we can't trust uh, public blockchains, that private blockchains are the way to go. And I was like, wow, I can't believe they just said this. Um, and I stopped them and I go, what makes you say this? They're like, public blockchains are inefficient, they are, um, they're inefficient, they're not secure. I go, I'm sorry, last time I checked, Bitcoin has been running fine since 2009. You show me a private database that has been running without any attacks on it and information release since that time, and I will agree with your comment. And I go, it's very confusing for me because you have all been selected as an expert in your field to come here and represent an idea that can possibly affect the entire globe. And the information that you're giving out is false and you haven't researched it properly. So another gentleman from another university put on a slide and this slide said, uh, issues with blockchains and you know these things and one of them was uh, blockchains are a huge waste of electricity I, and I stopped him again I, well after he was done I go which blockchain are you talking about you know there are hundreds if not thousands of different variations in this so-called blockchain of yours and if you're talking about Bitcoin no one really goes around saying, well, gold, mining gold is a waste of energy. Well, let's stop it. No one, I've never heard anyone say that. But with Bitcoin, suddenly people have these really creative ideas. And let's say it was hypothetically a waste of energy. You're talking about Bitcoin. What about all the other ones that work differently? What about all the other ones that are proof of stake that work through, uh, for example, storage that uses your computer uh, storage to provide or create the tokens? I go, your generalization is quite dangerous because people will come up to you and they look up to you as experts in the field. And this information you're relaying can not only damage and hinder the progress of something that could potentially benefit a lot of people on this planet, um, it's just plain wrong and you should take responsibility. I mean, simple as that. So what lessons can we learn from these stories? Um, so I was speaking to the founder of Bitfinance, uh, and he had a very interesting comment to Wanda Kembo. And he said, I said, look, you know, you're from Zimbabwe. You have a Bitcoin exchange there. You've seen the scene. But now you see what's happening also in Venezuela. What can you tell them? What, what lessons did you learn from the hyperinflation that led to a $100 trillion note being printed in your country? that you can send back to these people. He goes, to be honest with you, don't trust the government with your money. Everything is sweet and everything is perfect until things turn. And then you realize who's really in power. And this is where things get a bit shaky because we like to think we live in a society where things are a bit better, that if things turn, we're protected, we're kind of backed by the government. And this isn't an attack on the government. They can do whatever they want, but we have personal choice in the matter. So I have a choice, for example, whether I use a fiat currency or I use a cryptocurrency. I have a choice whether to go to an educational institution run and endorsed by the government or a institution that's open and the information flows better and may align with my personal beliefs a bit better. So, Bringing it back to this, um, I think it's very important to note what can we learn, for example, from all the digital currencies. So people come out and say, well, Bitcoin should be the only one. Some others say Ethereum should be the only one. And this is a very romantic relationship people have with these digital currencies. But we kind of need to transcend and go back to it being a technology. And when you look at it like that, 
there have been people who have come into the digital currency uh, frame who came from a music background and they found a coin that reflected their beliefs through that music coin, for example. There are people who come from a storage or data center background who found storage, for example, something that resembles their beliefs. I believe each cryptocurrency is subjective on how you believe it should be. Um, Andreas Antonopoulos said this really well. He said there is no real Bitcoin. Bitcoin is subjective. If you believe Bitcoin Cash is your real Bitcoin, then you go after that network and you put your miners towards that network. If you believe another version of a cryptocurrency is your version of it, then you can go after that one. It is purely subjective. And I like the way he put it. He said if you have a basketball game, um, one people are playing by the rules, everything's strict, and other people are playing a bit shoving, they're a bit more rough. There is no real basketball game. It's just you decide which one you like to play and participate in, and that will be your version of the basketball game. Um, so that I find very interesting, and I think people should zoom out a bit. And you know, the romantic aspect of our relationship with cryptocurrencies is quite nice, but at the same time, we should open our minds to the possibilities of seeing them as a collective, that no matter which background you came from, perhaps there's a coin that's right for you. What can we learn from the internet? So internet started off as something that was you know, very liberal, and right now it's turned into this thing um, in our pockets that allows us to access, uh, we kind of went over that, access Facebook and Twitter and all these other things. But it can also be very powerful, it can educate the individual. So my personal perspective on it is, Cryptocurrencies, blockchain, Bitcoin itself, and many other cryptocurrencies. You know, it started off as this open, free, liberating technology. And throughout the way, I'm seeing the more mainstream it becomes, it's starting to kind of lose that message. Um, the more, the people that used to kind of laugh at it, the bankers, the, the corporations, they used to laugh at cryptos and say, oh, look at you guys, this is just a joke suddenly took an interest, and now they are pushing it out as though it's their technology. Um, it's their conferences, so pay us 300 bucks to come into our corporate event, and we'll send invites out to executives. And for me, this is very alarming, because I love going on the stage in these conferences and just letting them know, you stand here right now claiming that this technology is very good, yet three years ago you guys were laughing at it. You must never forget that this technology was open source, that there is no owner, that we are all a part of it, that we must not allow the message to be lost throughout the way, and it is always lost through, uh, through convenience. So, you know, ING or other forms of global banks can come out and say, here's your Bitcoin wallet, please use that bank to do it. And that is very convenient for the average person. But we must never forget the idea is to hold your own private key. The idea is to be your own bank, not allow, the, I mean, Bitcoin didn't come out to say, you know, let's start virtual banks. No, you are the bank. You keep it in your pocket, in a file, wherever the, you want to keep it. And I think it's very important to not lose track of that message. So an organization, kind of like stepping it away from those messages, um, this kind of becomes a bit more personal at this stage. So this is an organization um, I and two other people founded about a month ago, so it's quite relatively new. And the idea was there's an uprise of digital societies coming out. So for me, decentralized autonomous organizations are very natural and organic when compared to uh, you know, these synthetic models that we use in our societies with hierarchy, top-down, which are very inefficient. They do not communicate the message well. So, my apologies. So, Agathia, for me, is a f stepping stone to kind of allow the technologies that exist. So, there's so many blockchain applications. Um, if they were kind of put into this right package, so Bitcoin, for example, uses a few plugins and puts it together to form what it is Bitcoin, um, obviously with the former code there as well. And in the same manner, if we take these blockchain applications that exist, and if we can kind of pile them together in the right form, we can form the right tools for people to be able to use them without them even knowing they're using them. And I think that's a great starting point. And I would love to see more of these, giving people the tools to start their own societies. So it is, for me, a transcendence above nations because 
in many ways, people hold their nations dear to them, their culture dear to them. And it shouldn't be about conversion of these things. It should be more about you know, creating your own societies and creating your own entities, organizations, and allowing the freedom of participation. And I really like this chart as well because, you know, as a solution, we can see the sharing economy rapidly growing. And this is a great example of decentralization because it really shows when it's available, people obviously will opt into a service that allows them to connect with other individuals while saving a lot of cost. And it makes a lot more sense to share your room with someone or take someone's room for a short period of time rather than stay at a hotel. Um, it takes it back to the traditional sense of peer-to-peer -peer manner or a uh, person dealing with another individual. So storage for me is a great example of this as well because in the same manner that Airbnb allows you to rent out your room, and I love that today I saw a white paper, I forget the name of it, but there is an organization that's aiming to uh, start a decentralized uh, version of Airbnb and I think this is a great step forward with zero commission. Because right now, if you book Airbnb, there's a lot of commission on there, and this hinders uh, progress towards decentralization when you have these things. So a great example of it would be eBay and Amazon versus Open Bazaar. Open Bazaar has no fees, and that's beautiful to see, compared to Amazon and eBay, which charge between 12 to 15 percent to just be the middleman. So when you remove the centralization uh, system, you get a lot of uh, benefits and bonus in in the process. So storage in the same way um, allows you to rent out your hard drive to other farm, uh, sorry, to rent out your hard drive so other people can store their data in it in an encrypted, decentralized, distributed manner. And by doing this, you're rewarded. And I think that's a much better approach. So I said before, banks use your metadata. It would be nice if we were given the option of uh, opting into these things, if we were given the option of opting into advertisements and being rewarded for it. And I think that choice is very important. So to put it all together, um, Bitopia is an educational uh, organization I started about two months ago because I wanted to bring all this knowledge and kind of help people understand it. There's, there's a lot of mismatch information right now. And it's getting a bit scary for me because you know, you have JP Morgan CEO who is like part of the 2008 crash who his organization has been fined so many times for so many dodgy things, can come out and scare people out of Bitcoin by saying, oh, it's a fraud. I mean, it's bizarre for me. And people actually believe these individuals. I mean, you can go look at a video from him from 2015 or 16, where he's saying no nation will ever accept Bitcoin. It will be in the form of US dollar, and the United States will ban it and make it illegal. And you can see the fear coming through him. And you have to have some sort of a, you know, if, feel sorry for them in some ways because they can see they're crumbling, the, the floor is crumbling beneath them. But Japan now accepts it. In Switzerland, you can pay taxes in Bitcoin. And it really goes to show that these centralized masters that people kind of look up to can be wrong too. And we mustn't look at them as the, you know, the, the senders of the true message or anything like that. Quite the contrary. So to wrap it all up, uh, we can see kind of corruption within society, the effects of centralization and giving one or two individuals the power to dominate an entire nation, an entire organization, whether it's money, finance, education. Um, these all have some issues in some way. And by decentralizing an organization and allowing participation to be voluntary and transparent, you can have free flow of information. So whether it's a decentralized society where the entire society acts as a collective and information relays back and forward. Um, or it's an organization such as a company or a corporation um, working in a decentralized manner. You can have much more rapid growth. And this was also seen in few nations throughout wars where they didn't put too much focus on patenting ideas and trying to control everything rather than the progress of the entire nation's uh, technological movement. And we can already see this a lot in the different spaces. I hope you enjoy my talk. Um, I know it was a very kind of all over the place, but uh, I just really want to put it out there. And we have a responsibility, as I said, to make sure the message of blockchain 
uh, the underlying technology behind Bitcoin remains open and it remains free for people to access. And one of the things that really bothers me right now is that, you know, the fee is so high that merchants can't even accept it. I mean, downstairs you saw that, you know, you got to almost use Litecoin because the fees are high. And I got into this space because I believe Bitcoin was a form of payment for the unbanked and underserved. And right now it is far from that and it stopped being that. And I hope you can return to that um, because, you know, s s that's where the real power comes from, allowing people to participate within the network and feeling a part of it, not just providing it as an exclusive uh, package to some individuals who believe, ah, oh, if you want to send some money around, you've got to be willing to pay for it. Um, yeah, thank you for listening. I, I want to hear some of your questions. Uh, I'm not just here to present. I really want to hear some feedback, what your thoughts are, if you have any doubts of the space, of the movement. Um, it would be great to engage some sort of a conversation. But thank you for listening. Great presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, well, if I can have a first question, then. Uh, my question is, do you think uh, such cases as uh, Venezuela and Zimbabwe are uh, still going to be like present in the near future? Uh, and if it's going to, uh, if, uh, if yes, uh, is it going to cause more adoption, uh, like bigger adoption of decentralized tools? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I've thought about this a lot, actually, because as I said, uh, you know, you can look at Venezuela and Zimbabwe as they're living in the past. But for me, they're living into the, in the future because they already have come to accept the conditions between their relationship with the government and the monetary system. So I do believe the same thing is going to happen in other parts of the world. After the 2008 crash, did people stop getting loans? No. Did they change their purchasing habits? No. Was there a mental uh, evolution towards understanding that debt is bad? No. The entire money system functions on debt. If you remove the debt, there's no money left in the system. So the only way it can kind of progress forward is by accumulating more debt. Um, so I do believe that since 2008, the debt has increased by five times or something like that, um, that there will be another crash. And, you know, it could be seen as a bit pessimistic, but you have an opportunity to not crash with the ship. Um, you have an opportunity, thanks to cryptocurrencies, to tap out of that system. Um, you have silver, you have gold, I don't know, you can, you can look into it yourself. I'm not here to advise you on what to put it in. But, the point is you have an opportunity, you have a choice um, to tap out. In other generations, such as Venezuela or Zimbabwe, they didn't have access to freely and easily change their currencies or their wealth into another form um, as rapidly as we can. And I do believe since 2008, back then China didn't have much of a debt. But right now China has a massive debt. Um, there's ghost cities, like over a thousand ghost cities or something like that all over China, uh, which is, you know, all this infrastructure that was built and they're just kind of abandoned because money ran out or it didn't go as planned. And if it comes crashing down, either two things will happen, in my opinion anyways. Uh, I don't know how much that is worth. but. Either A, like you said, people will say, well, we can't trust a centralized currency, let's switch over to a form of digital currency such as Bitcoin. Or in the moment of panic and disturb, um, people will be given a solution like they are in every other catastrophic events in history. And the government will be like, well, let's scrap out that system and here's the new digital currency privately owned by us, please switch over. Um, which is kind of something that's happening, you can see in the countries that are getting rid of cash um, and trying to f move people into using a national or nation state based digital currency. And I think that's quite scary. And I would hate to see in the moment of panic uh, that kind of idea being pushed onto people. Well, oh, thank you very much. Uh, so, any questions? Yeah. Well, I I believe that when uh, when we say that we don't we should not trust the state money anymore, that we are completely right. But we we need uh, to not lose our ideology. Maybe in the simplification of our slogans, we have. Uh, seeded this this loose of our ideas because when we say uh, uh, with trust on crypto as we can use crypto also the state can use it for his interest so i, I believe we we could we could try to avoid this this 
um, the sculptation of, of the technology that was born in the open and it's tried to, to be copted by private banks and states to do their interest, it's is to remember that it's not just that we trust that the technology. We, we trust the technology and we trust our peers. We decide who are our peers and who is the community we trust. Because yes, it's a personal, it's a personal choice to, um, to, to use a cryptocurrency of a, or a fiat currency, but the fact that they, this, this, choice may, this choice makes sense depends on the community that is behind it. If, if there is just one, one person that uses a cryptocurrency, it's, it's meaningless. But we have, we have to, to return to this sense of community that is, that is as born, that is where the cryptocurrencies and the free software in general are born. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, and that's why it's very important to let people know of these uh, choices because a lot of people don't. And for me, it's very similar, I guess, if you compare Signal or Telegram to Facebook Messenger and you know, other centralized, very centralized, closed source ones. Majority of people use, just don't know about Telegram. You know, I've, I've met so many individuals, like I live in a bit of a bubble where I think everyone knows Telegram. But so many people I meet, hey, do you have Telegram or Signal? And they're just like, what is that? Um, and again, you know, it's the echoing messages through media and like, the environment that kind of relays Facebook Messenger, but never talks about Signal or Telegram. And yeah, it's kind of hard to battle with that loud noise in society, you know? But all you can do is kind of let a few individuals around you know, and hope they will tell a few other individuals. But I don't know how to attack it from a larger perspective. Um, hello. Uh, you have talked about the, the centralized autonomous uh, societies. Um, is that different from the centralized autonomous organizations or are they the same thing? No, it's different because it's more to operate, uh, for me, physical hubs or organized uh, or off-the-grid societies or, for example, there are an organization called Pandora Hub. What they do is in Spain they go and find uh, abandoned villages, which has le has become a thing due to people moving into the capital cities a lot, the younger generation anyways, because there's more jobs, more people, and it's kind of the way it goes. And these villages have gone from like 5,000 people down to 4,000, 3,000, 2,000, and it's slowly kind of dying out. So what these people have done is gone and gone to these places and allowed people to come and uh, kind of co-work from these places. So it would be nice to give them a form of technological uh, frame to work and form these new societies in, uh, which is beyond organizations, because you're kind of tapping out of capital cities and going to like rural villages. And to give these people this framework is very important, in my opinion. Um, they actually need it, and it allows them to function without needing to rely on the state in many ways, um, without attacking nationality or any other thing in that manner. Uh, so it's more of a society approach rather than organization which could be just for work, um, starting a company on a, on a blockchain, so to say, like Aragon, uh, an example of it. Okay, yeah, thank you. No yes, uh, more, quest more questions, please? Okay, here. Thanks for the great speech. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, you were talking about uh, government uh, cryptocurrencies or like, official state cryptocurrency, uh, which is, I think, the biggest threat is in the nations where people are very nationalist, like in terms of following the government. So which, uh, besides to USA, is probably Russia. And I wanted to ask you, what do you think about uh, if would Russia have their own uh, national cryptocurrency, which would put in, uh, you know, spread. How this could, uh, how this could influence the cryptocurrency world or, co or community? Sure. No, that's a really good question. Um, for me, a private blockchain is just a database in many ways. Um, you know. Blockchain is supposed to be distributed and decentralized. If you remove that aspect of it and privatize it, you lose a lot of the security capabilities of it and a lot of the uh, protection tools that come with it. And 
for a nation to switch over to a digital currency wouldn't be any wouldn't be too different to what's happening now like 92 or 90 like a lot a higher percentage of currencies currently is digital um, cash only amounts to like two or three percent of the currency in circulation so it wouldn't be that radically different to what's happening now uh, it would probably be used as a hype to be like, oh, look, it's blockchain. Everyone's talking about it. This is our version of it. Don't trust these kids in their basement, so to say. Um, here's the nation version of it. We know what we're doing better. So the influence, I guess, would be on that aspect. Uh, it wouldn't be a radical change to what we're doing now. It would probably benefit uh, the banks a bit more because they were able to save fees if it's done that way. But I hope. <laughs> and it may be a not a nice thing to hope for, that if they do privatize blockchains, that the keys get leaked out, um, and they can learn a very valuable lesson on that, in that sense, because you know, in an in a, in a open decentralized network, if my keys get stolen, only my funds are taken. But if you have keys even stashed between 10 people, you know, people will really want to get those keys. Um, and I hope one way or another they do, and that will be a funny day. Um, but yeah, that, that's my kind of outlook on it, my positive view in a negative way. Yeah. But I don't know, we'll see what happens. And, and I heard Japan is going to re release Japcoin or something like that. Uh, I don't know, like it's funny to see these things. I mean, Estonia They're wanted trying to, to centralize what should be decentralized, and, and they are still trying to centralize it. Yeah. Again, um, Andreas Antonopoulos has a great saying with this, he's like the helicopter parents Zero time I have left. It's well, <laughs> well, maybe one last question. Yes, Is there any one question left? Well, then thank you very much. Uh, thank you again. No it was great.